This session, we discuss on recursive functions. So as you remember, in the last session, uh, we discussed uh, pure functions. Pure functions are the functions we take, which takes some inputs and produce the output. So for same inputs, it should produce the same output. There should not be any side effects on pure functions. So in the functional programming, a collection of pure functions and maybe recursive functions and what we call it as lambda functions, we discuss in some other course, other, other session, right? So the idea of the lecture today is to uh, introduce you the recursions. So as you know, when you write functions, inside some functions, we can call other functions. So in the programming, very interestingly, we can call the same function inside the function. So if you call the same function within, this, the, within that function, we call it as recursion. So you may learn recursion in other uh, classes as well, but let's have a look a little bit in detail how recursions works, what type of recursions are available, why it is very interesting concepts in programming. So in the first example, I will show you a recursion function called BLAST. So this function, as you see, take a one input type and it return anything, it's fine. It's a un unsigned int return, that's any anything. And then here it prints the line. So whatever we input here as an input n, it prints that value here. After that, it check whether the given n is less than or equal to one. If so, it prints this word blast off. If not, in the else part, you see, I call the function for a blast. Where do I define this function? Here. So that means within the same function, I call that. I call the same function within the body of the function. So that call it as recursion. So what's happen if you call that particular function called blast with number three? So if you call it with a number three, so, so first, first instance, it print the number three, and three is not less than or equal one. So because of that, it calls again the blast function with number two. So then it print number two. Then in, it print number one. And then finally, it print blast off. So you see, it's, it's called the same function in several rounds, and then it gets stopped. So as I said, the execution of the blast begins with n3 and print 3 on the terminal. Since n greater than 1, call itself. And then execution of blast begins with number 2 again. And then it print 2. And since 2 is greater than 1, then it's call itself. And then its execution starts with n1 and in print one on the terminal. Now n is equal to one, because of that, it print blast off. It may not be called that function again. So it just print blast off. And with that, it stop repeatedly calling the same function. So this condition which we check to stop recursively or repeatedly calling the same function, it call it as base condition, based on the base condition, the pre-calling of the same function get it so. So that's how basically recursion works. In recursive applications, we can see two types of recursions are available. Those recursions are called as direct recursion and indirect recursion. And direct recursions calls directly and indirect recursions calls the same functions indirectly. 
So when you think about the direct recursions, we can identify several types of direct recursions. So in the first category, we call it as a linear recursions. In the linear recursions, we call the same function within that only once. So that call is the last function or last, last statement on the program or the function, then we call it as tail recursion. So we can call the same function at any, any place from the function, in the, inside the function, maybe from the beginning or maybe at the middle, maybe at the end or wherever the place. If we call that last function at the end, that is special, it's called it as tail recursion. So maybe we can call the last uh, same function at the beginning, then we call it as a head recursion. And basically in general, we divide this linear recursion into two groups that call tail recursion and non-tail recursion. The tail recursion is called the same function at the end. In non-tail recursion, call the same function at any other place. Then we have a group of multiple recursions. The multiple recursions actually we call the same function several times more than once within the body of the function. So if we call the same function two times, we call it as binary recursion. If you call this function within the argument of the same function, we call it as nested recursion. Like that, there are different types of multiple recursions we can see. So as I mentioned, the main type of, or the popular type of recursive functions we can see in, in the computer area or the functional programming is linear recursive functions. Among those linear recursive functions, most of them are tail recursive functions. And but we can see the non-tail recursive functions as well. So we will take some example and study how those tail recursive and non-tail recursive works. The tail recursive is very important and popular because in that tail recursive function, we can use the same stack frame to store the temporary values when calling the same function. When the last call is stopped, basically all functions get terminated. We don't need to keep the state of previous calls in the next call because actually the recall of the same function is the last call. So let's take some example to understand that. The best example for tail recursion functions to explain is greatest common device or the JCD function. There is a theorem called Euclidean theorem available. So that simplifies the calculation of greatest common device. Euclidean defines the greatest common divisor of any two given number A and B is equal to the greatest common divisor of the small number B and the modulo of A modulo B, that is R. So then there is a base condition defined. If, if we reach a, Euclid, a GCD A and zero, if our small number is zero, the greatest common divisor function of A and zero is A. So that is our base condition. So this is our recursive condition. So when you code it in Scala or any other functional programming language or any other language, so the greatest common divisor function might look like that. So we create a function called greatest common divisor which take two inputs and we match the last input. And if that last input or the B is zero, so the greatest common divisor is always A. So if actually, the second number is larger than the first one. So we have to swap that and execute this algorithm. So for that, in this situation, we call that same function by swapping the parameter. Instead of calling A and B, we call the GCD with B and A. So that's why we put A to the last and B is matched to X, so X put it in the first, as the first parameter. So that call is only once. So actually tail recursion call is this. So any other instance so it's not equal to zero or this situation, this is default. And this call tells about default call. And we call the GCD with the small number B 
V equal to X, no, we call it with X. So we can direct line V here with A modular B or A modular X, whatever. So we then we can get this answer. So I will run that demo later on in a separate video and show how it works. It's very interesting, this will call until this last parameter get it zero and then it returns A. So that is the greatest common divisor of these two given numbers. Similarly, we can use recursive function, maybe tail recursion, to calculate uh, prime numbers. Prime numbers. So you know the prime numbers are the numbers which divide by one and the number itself. So we can use the function of greatest common divisor to identify prime numbers. So for example, if you calculate, let's say we want to find it out, the given number n is the prime. So then what we can do, we first calculate the GCD of n and two. So if there is a factor, we can see between n and two, that means n is not a prime. So for example, when you calculate GCD of n and two, let's say it get it zero. Sorry, let it get it, let's say it's get one. That means there are no common factors other than one which divide by both n and two. So that means n is maybe a prime number. So not only for two, we have to find it out whether there are common factors with three, four, five, up to n, or up to square root of n in the optimized version. So if there are no factors in that particular range, we know there are no factors, so then n is a prime. So we can write a recursive function for that in very simply something like that. We call the, we define a function called prime, which take two inputs. First one is the number, which we want to check whether it's a prime. And then the second one is an internal parameter. It's initialized with two. And that returns Boolean value. That means, if the given p is prime, it returns true, otherwise it returns false. So then we take the first one, n match, and this value of n, it's initially is two assigned to x. Then we, we check whether this x value and p value is equal. If so, we return true. Then obviously true is a prime number, two is a prime number. So initially if we have any, if these two are equal. So let's say if we enter six here, six not equal P there, right? So it comes here. Then it check whether, uh, it's calculate the GCD of P and X. Initially it calculate the GD, GCD of P and two. If our initial value has six and two, it calculate GCD of six and two. So the result is greater than one. That means definitely P is not a prime number. That means P and X have a common factor. So this is P is not a prime number. So we return false. In other cases, all other cases, what we do, we call the same function, which may be by increasing uh, this N by one or n is equal to x, so we increase x by one, and we call the same function. In other words, let's say our example is six and two, so we call again the prime six and three, like that. So we repeatedly call by increasing uh, n from two to one by one. If you see any common factors with any of these numbers, when you're calling it, it's obviously not a prime. If you don't see any factors until these two numbers get equal, then we know it is a prime. So this, this is the not prime condition. This is a prime condition and also the base condition of this recursion. So it's called the same function at the end. So because of that, it is a tail recursion. 
right? I will give you some exercise maybe later on to find out, uh, write a recursive function called prime sequence where it calculates the prime numbers from two to a given n. Maybe if I enter n, 100, you should print, your function should print the prime numbers from one to 100. So try to implement yourself this. I will show you how to implement this later on. And by understanding how this works, you can further go through the, and implement the prime sequence function, which prints all the sequence of, sequence of prime numbers up to the given n. Right. Now let's have a look on non-tail recursive functions. In the non-tail recursive functions for the recursions, not at the last one, maybe as the first, or maybe somewhere at the middle. So in order to understand how it works, let's take a function or implement a function for a print n that prints numbers from m, n to m. So we give two parameters to this n and m, let's say phi and 10. So then it should print the numbers from 10 to phi. Okay. So m is the larger number we assume. Okay. So this is a very simple recursive function which I implemented at the prompt, Scala prompt. So I create a defined function called print n, take two numbers n and m, we assume m is greater than n and it not, don't return anything. So I put return type any, and this is my recursive call. So my recursive call is if n is smaller than m, I recall the same function by increasing the value of n. So I, let's say my example, my n is five, m is 10. So then I, n less than m is true. So then I call that, again with n6 and m10. So it come back here and then again that condition is true. I call again this print n with 7, 10, then again with 8, 10, 9, 10. And when it comes to 10, so this gets false and it may not call that function back again. So then what happened if it is not it call it again so the last call will end because that may not execute. So last call will end and print the value n on the terminal. It's terminate at the place where n less than m, that is n equal 10, my example. So then it print 10 on the terminal. After it terminate the last call, so you see in the previous call, stop here because when it comes here, if that condition satisfies, recall the functions again without completing it. So only the last call, we are not recalling back because of that, it completes the last call. So when it completes the last call, actually last call made by the previous call, so then it comes here and then try to complete the previous call. So in the previous call, n value is nine in my example. So nine get print then on the terminal and finish the previous call. Then it comes to the other code, like the, the one calls the previous call like that. So it's returning back. So as you may understood in the final call it print 10 and then in reverse back print nine, eight, seven, five. Try this on the terminal, very interesting, you get the reverse order of the numbers. By understanding the same concept, you can implement a function, recursive function for power. That will calculate the power of some given number. For example, when you went for the recursive function for power two four, you should calculate two to the power four, that is 16. How can you implement such function recursively? So here is my example, how to code that. So you know when you calculate any power, 
any number to the power of zero is one. So that is our base condition. So when you calculate x to the zero power, it's actually one. So we have a power function, which this is the base and this is the power, and it returns the answer, it is integer. So we take y match, and if the last part is zero, that is power zero, you know one, answer is one. So any other cases, what is the answer? So any other cases, we, we can define as x to the power of previous, n minus one. So for example, if you want to calculate two to the power n, that is equal to multiply two to the power n minus one. So if you calculate, want to calculate any x to the power n, we can say x to the power n is equal to x multiply x to the power n minus one. So that is the definition. So, so that is the recursive definition. So x to the power zero is the base definition that is one, everybody knows. So I return the base definition here and do the recursive definition here, the recursive code here. So I say any other cases, power is equal to the x base multiplied power of the previous, x y minus one. So then what's happened? So you might think this is a tail recursive because this equaling the same function as the last code. Actually, it's not because we call the same function as the last statement, but after that call, there is some calculation to do. So then what happens if you call the power, let's say with two and three, for example, that is two to the power three, it comes here, three, is not matched to zero, so it not return one. It comes to the default case. Then it calculate two multiply power two three minus one. That is two. We call the power function is two to the power two. Then, so it not comes here, and it comes here, and then we it say two to the power two is equal to x multiply power. 2 to the power 1. So it not also comes here. So it comes here. It's not returning here. It comes here. And then calculate 2 multiply power 2 to the power 1 minus 1 is 0. 2 to the power 0. So when that final call is 2 to the power 0 in my example comes here. So then 0 matches 1. It return 1. So in the last call return 1 with 1. So when it returned last call with one, so it tried to calculate the answer. So then answer is one multiply, this is two, no? two, that is two. So then it returns two to the previous. And with that two, it tried to calculate the, this equation or the expression, that is two to the power two, that is four, it four returns the previous. So it comes then, four multiply two, that is eight, then it re eight returns back to the application. Like that, you can call this power function with any two given numbers. It recursively calls the same power functions and eventually find the answer at the end. Other big example which you can use to understand, the recursion is factorial. So that is a very common, if you say recursive, everybody use factorial to explain that. The factorial is, calculation is multiplication of all numbers up to n. If you want to calculate factorial n, we need to multiply from one to n, all numbers. So for example, factorial four is one multiply, two multiply, three multiply, four, that is 24. Factorial six is one multiply, two multiply, three multiply, four multiply, six. That is 720. Can you write a recursive function for that? Yes, we still we can. So how it would look like? It would look like something like that. So what's happened? We call the factorial x with any number n. Assume that is 3. So it comes to this x match statement. That is 3 match. 
if three match to the case one, that is false. In case it match to one, it return X. If not in the default, what happened? It's false. X multiply factorial X minus one. So my initial call is three, then it call X multiply three minus one, that is two. So the same function, then this is not satisfied, it's called uh, here and it's called two multiply then one. So then it comes here, obviously one equal, then uh, X get equal to one, then it return X, that is it returns one. So you can understand that nicely using this figure. So let's assume in this example, I'm calling my factorial function with four. This is first call, that is N4. So then it recursively call that factorial with N2. This is second call. Then it call it back with N2, third call, N1, fourth call, when it call with N0 call, basically it returns once. So when it returns once, it calculate one multiply one, this is one, it returns here. Then it calculates one multiply two. That is answer two, with the answer two, it returns here. Then it calculates two with the three, two multiply three, answer six. Answer six, six, answer six it's call it here. Then it call three, six multiply four, final answer returns to the first score, that is 24. So that's how it goes. It's calling the function one after other until it hit the base condition, it returning all the things back to the beginning. So while it returning, we do whatever we ask to do. So that is how non-tail recursive functions works. So this is another picture where you can look at to understand this recursion. So for example, here I calculate this factorial with three is six multiply factorial with five. Then I call it back, that is six multiply, fact, five multiply factorial four. Then it call it back, that is four multiply factorial three. Then three multiply factorial two. Then uh, two multiply factorial one. And then two multiply factorial one return two. With this two, it returns to the other. With that, it returns to the next. With that it returns to the next, and with that returns to the next, finally we get that. So it's called the frame function one, two, three, four, five, six times, uh, to, and then find the final answer of the sixth call. And with that answer one, it complete the fifth call. He did previously, and then it returns two. With that two, he complete the fourth call. And then it return six. With that six, it complete the Second call that is actually 24 returns. Then with the 24, it's complete the last kind of like this second call. So the second call is 120, and with that it complete the final first call that is 107. So till it hit the base, it call it again and again, and then complete the, all the rest of the things remaining in the same function. So that is non-tail recursion. In the tail recursion, so what's happened? If terminate here, there are no other works to do. So all the other calls will automatically get terminated without any calculations. So usually it's non-tail recursion will terminate somewhere here because nothing to do after that. So in the tail recursion, in the tail non-tail recursion, what happens after it complete last function, there are something left to do in the function. So then, Whatever I left to do, it will fall. Because recursive action is called somewhere at the middle before completing this function. If the recursive action calls at the end of the function, that is much easier or much simply and so on and much efficient. But in these situations like that, it gets complicated. So as you see, in this recursive, we call that same function only once. If you call it in multiple times, the situation is much complex. We will discuss in a minute. So here in this problem, I'm asking you to print this pattern. Print one, then two, one, then three, two, one, four, three, two, one. So I ha we have already discussed how to do kind of print 
3, 2, 1 on the terminal. So by using the same concept, we can write a recursive function to print a pattern in. The pattern name means if you call that pattern, it's one, it should be here, and with two, it should be like that, and three, it should be like that. If you call pattern four, we have to get this pattern on the terminal. You can try to implement that yourself. Right. So as I mentioned, if you call the recursion with within the body, if you call the same function only once, that is even complex. So how about we call the same function multiple times in the body? So you see it's then we ended up with the complicated, we really, really complicated concept. But in order to solve some problems, such recursion is very simple and very interesting to use. So if you call the same function twice in the body, let's call it as binary recursive calls. But not only twice, we can call it in maybe two, three times if you, if you wish. The best I would ask, example to understand this multiple recursive to little bit uh, to discuss the binary recursive, it's also multiple recursive type that is calling the same function twice. Fibonacci number series is the series of numbers where we could use to understand this concept. Fibonacci series is something defined like that. So it is defined, if Fibonacci zero is defined as zero, Fibonacci one is defined as one, any other number in this series is actually addition of the previous two. So that means, you see, this, this number is addition of previous two, that is zero, one, add together, we get one. Then we add one, one together, we get two. Then we add one, two together, we get three. Then we add three, two, five. Three, five, eight. Five, eight, thirty. Eight, thirteen, twenty-one. Thirteen, twenty-one, thirty-four. So like that, we, have, we can generate sequence of numbers. So that sequence is in mathematical, maths called as Fibonacci series. Can you write a recursive function to do that? Obviously we can do that using non-recursive ways, but in the recursive ways it's very interesting because we have only three conditions. Using these three conditions we define this series. What are these three conditions? First one is if given number is zero, the answer should be zero. If given number is one, answer should be one. If given number is any other thing, answer should be adding two previous numbers together. So we can directly put this into the recursive function. So if we put this recursive Fibonacci, it's something look like, so it's called Fibonacci n and n match. If that n is zero, it's zero. If n is one, return value is one here. Yeah. Any other case here, Fibonacci is n minus one plus n minus two, so that's it. So when you call Fibonacci five, it returns the fifth element of the series. So how do you calculate the Fibonacci five? You see, if I call Fibonacci five, these two conditions may not satisfy because it's, we call, our n is five, so in, it comes to here, then it calls with n minus one plus n minus two. n minus one is basically four, n minus two is three. It calls the same function twice, f is a Fibonacci function, twice, first with four, and then with three. So when you call it with the same function four, it comes here and check whether these two condition is not satisfied. So because of that, it called back this three and two. So then it comes here with three, it call it back with two and one. Then it comes here and then it call with one and zero. So when you call it one and zero, basically two times one and zero. And then when it call with Fibonacci one, you see it's one equal one, it return one. And then it call, then it go, then it get an answer for this side, one. 
then at that particular call it goes to the other side so it gets the answer zero so we add then one to zero answer is one it returns to this then it knows the f2 so by knowing f2 he try to find f1 again so f1 again is one you can see it's then one it's add one to two and that is three it get the answer for this so if you get the answer for this is try to compute the answer with f2 and recall this one and zero back and get the answer for f2 and add to that and from zero so when it get the answer for this branch it move to this file and then recalling those functions in a similar matter and comes here the answer and finally add this two and return back you see so as a binary tree it call it one after other two calls that is binary recursive example so it's obviously multiple recursive not only two if you can sometimes you can do more we can call that same function more than two times so then it's you see we ended up with a very complicated situation but in the readability form readability why is this form uh, these functions are very clear it tells the system what we need it not tell the system how we should do that so that is the essence of the core functional program in the functional programming we say what we need we need we define that in the case of zero it is one case of one it is one in other all other cases n minus one plus n minus two so we don't tell the system how to do that but we tell the system what we need so that is functional program so in case if you want to write a, if we want to get the sequence of fabulous numbers we can add another recursive function maybe till 10 recursive on top of this binary recursion so for example, let's say Fibonacci sequence will give the base sequence of Fibonacci numbers starting from zero to maybe given n. So here I call it the Fibonacci with 10. So it would first 10 Fibonacci numbers. How do I do that? So if I check whether the given n is greater than zero, if so, I call the same sequence once with n minus one. Then n minus two, n minus three and so on <coughs> when you get n minus like finally when you get fibonacci zero it will, will return zero and zero will be print then it called fibonacci one and terminate with one and get back final to fibonacci 10. so from 10 n will reduce one by one and then ask for the same function again and again after it reach one it comes in and first print the fabulous is here so then it calls the recursive function here so this recursive is multiple recursive and this recursive is recursive <coughs> so we see so we to we we can have functions implementing recurse, recursive form or recursion using recursion recursion methods for recursive forms and combine those functions in any way to get the final answer what we need so that's how functional programming works <coughs> very interestingly we could have mutual recursive as well so that is the way we do indirect recursion if I repeat, there are two categories, direct and indirect recursions. Direct recursions call the same function directly. There are two types, like linear and multiple direct recursion. In the linear direct recursion, we call the same function only once. In the multiple direct recursion, we call that same function more than once. Under linear recursion, we can call the same function at the end, that call it as the recursion. Or in the linear recursion, we can call the same function at any other cases. Then we call it as non trivial recursive functions. So all are linear recursive because only one call. Then in the direct rec under direct recursive, there are multiple calls. So one of the big example is binary recursive. In the binary recursive, we do two calls. 
So we discuss the example of fibrosis. Not only two, we can have multiple folds. So then situation is much more complicated. You will get confused with further. So I'm not going to discuss. So you can try yourself and see what happens. So all are direct recursive. So similarly, in the recursion, indirect recursive works. Indirect recursive means, for example, there is a function called A that might call a function called B, and then B might call a function C, and C might again call A. So that is kind of mutual recursive. Because A is not calling directly A. A is calling B, B is calling C, then it's called A. So like mutually calls. So best nice example to understand mutual recursion is to implement the function to find it out even and odd numbers. So I, I think we have already experienced and wrote a function to find the even numbers. There we see whether even number modulo two equal to zero if it is even, otherwise it is a, uh, it is odd. So there is one way of finding even odd number. So someone can build a method to find an odd and even numbers like that. So for example, how do you know if a number is even? Basically, we know it's a zero is to be considered as even. And if uh, any number n is even, we know n minus one is odd, right? So for example, if number zero is we know even, if we know four is even, then we know three is odd. So if you know like two is even, then zero is even. Uh, if you know two is even, then zero is odd or something like this. So sorry, see if two is even, one is odd. Like that, if six is even, five is odd. So any given number n, you realize if that n is even, so we definitely know n minus one number is odd number. Similarly, how do you know about odd? So we can say if a number is not odd, that is even. So, or, or a number is not even, that is odd. So, in the example, so if you want to write a function called odd, and we already have a function called even, we, we can say if it is not even, then this is odd. So how can we convert that to a mutual recursive function? So it's very simple. So we define a function called is even, and it return a boolean whether the given number is even, it return boolean true, otherwise it return boolean false. So then what happened? We say if it is a zero, it's a even number. In all the four case, we say is odd. We call the odd number with n minus one. So how do you define the even? We say if only even is true in this situation. Otherwise, if this is odd number, we call the odd. So that means we call another function called is odd. How do we define odd? We say is odd this if that number is odd, if this is not an even number, if n is not an even number. So you can try that very interesting example. So this is call it as n minus one odd, n minus one odd, n minus one odd like that. So when you call, n, and so for example, let's say we call uh, is even with true, uh, two. So it not comes here, it call is odd with two minus one, that is one. So when it comes here, it says is even with one not, it's odd. So then it call it back is zero. So A call B, B call A. So in it comes one, so it's not it comes here, here comes one. It call it then odd function with one minus one, that is zero. So it comes here then, it's odd zero, and go to this call, that is, is even zero. So then comes here, is even zero, it defined as two. 
So then it returns is even zero with two. And it not two. So then it returns it dot with false. So then it comes here, it's false. So finally, is even two return, uh, it's even three returns false. So it's very interesting. Maybe you can think about it, how it works. So it's complicated, but as you see, it's very nicely defined. So here we see what, what, what we need. So the functions are automatically calling themselves and finally give the answer based on our definition. So there we see in this function are not calling the same function. Instead of this is even function called is sort function and is sort function called is even. Is it mutually recursive? Or in other words, it's indirect recursion function. The indirect recursive example for indirect recursion. So you see recursion is very nice con uh, concept where we can apply in functional programming. So by doing that, we can very simply, we can simplify the solution for the problems we have. And by combining those solutions together, we can get, or we can code very precisely some problems. So if you code like that, so this is always correct. There are no bugs because it's, this is the correct definition. So if you try to do this, this may be uh, in the non-functional way using uh, maybe like if, if condition using if condition. So then we have to write uh, x n mod 2 equal to 0, that is 1, otherwise, or something like that. So if you miss this type that like if x uh, equal to, instead of checking modular equal to 0, we mo check modular equal to 1 and then return different value, then we answer get different. And uh, there is a more po probability to getting an error. But if you code like that, and there is error free because this is the definition. So you see, so the beauty of the functional programming codes. But when you do functional programming, you need to be very careful if you don't put your base condition properly, you may go into infinite regression. That means your function may never end. It falls again and again and again and again. Finally, the program gets crashed because it's infinitely called itself. So for example, here I print some value and I call the same function with n plus one. And then comes print that number and call it again, n plus one, n plus one, and so and so. So it's never in. I have not introduced here some base condition to terminate in this recursive function. Because of that, it repeatedly calls the same thing and get crashed at the end. So that is, that situations we call it as infinite recursions. So when you implement the recursive functions or recursive solutions, you need to be very careful not to enter into such situations. So that means you have to be very careful on your base condition of the termination point. So under which conditions that returns or that stop the execution without calling it again. So that is for it as base condition. Only any other situation, we call the same function again and again, but we have to write a condition within the body of the function, define how to stop it without calling it again. If there are no such base conditions, or if we not properly included a base condition, we might go for infinite regressions. Okay, with that, I can conclude that a session we discuss functional program. In a separate video, I will uh, demonstrate to you those codes and how it works. And after that, I will upload some uh, exercise uh, to the elements.